So this is community medicine part two. We're gonna be running through immunizations, some nutritional stuff and a few extras here and there under community medicine part two. So to get started, um, we, we have this routine immunization schedule. You should be familiar with it. There's a link there so you can see um, the uh, current recommendations for immunization schedules for uh, children. Um, we, we emphasize not to memorize the schedule itself. Is it two months, four months, six months, 18 months? Is it 12 to 15 months? That kind of stuff. That's something that's, you know, like you usually as the clinician are not doing. You need the higher order level of like what is the most common or the most serious side effect or what are we specifically trying to prevent if they come in with a vaccine associated illness, those types of things. And that is in the fine print usually. It's not just memorizing the schedule. So I'm gonna de-emphasize you know, when to give the uh, immunizations and talk about the immunizations and the diseases when we go through it. So we're gonna start with the childhood immunizations. And uh, there's an Institute of Medicine uh, report. And so I just wanna get this out of the way. Vaccines do not cause autism. Are we done? Um, uh, vaccines do not cause type one diabetes. I'm just gonna see if they've got my updated slides here. No, they don't. Okay, so my updated slide is I have a t-shirt, like I said, I wear under my scrubs when I'm in the hospital. And the one that I wear is uh, often is that vaccines cause adults. And I, I love wearing that one. And I wore it in New York City um, at a course recently. And I was at the course and I saw, Jess, I think her name is Jessica Beal. She's married to Justin Timberlake. And there was some stuff going on in California about you know vaccination and basically framing her as an anti-vaxxer. So I tweeted at her and said, you know, uh, with a picture of my shirt that says vaccines cause adults, not autism, right? And, uh, and then I tagged her husband in it, Justin Timberlake, and I said, you're not bringing sexy back, Justin. You're bringing measles back. <laughs> oh, did that go viral. Um, I got a little, uh, it just went poof, right? And as it turns out, Justin uh, Timberlake was in New York City at a songwriting convention thing in the same hotel I was at. When I was, and so I'm walking around the hotel with my t-shirt going, where is he, where is he? I'm gonna to talk to JT. So anyways, it doesn't cause autism, people. It causes adults. So we're gonna run through these. Diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Diphtheria, uh, diphtheria if you get a picture on the uh, exam with a thick, membranous uh, oral pharynx, okay, so first of all, the worst looking picture of the back of the throat is mono, not strep, right? It's like, oh my God, did a bird poop in the back of your mouth? You know, that's how bad it looks. But with diphtheria, it's this thick membrane on the tonsillar pillars, and that's how you make the diagnosis um, uh, visually. Tetanus, of course, we're familiar with that, and lockjaw, and certainly it's in uh, contaminated soil. It's not the rusty nail. It's the soil that the rusty nail is in that you step on. And of course, lockjaw, but also, you know, the end stages, those severe spasms like that. Anybody here seen a case of diphtheria? Okay, a few. I haven't. Tetanus? Never seen a case of tetanus in 25 years. Pertussis? Yes, okay. So the vaccine is about 80% effective for pertussis. So I'm, I've seen pertussis, but I haven't seen diphtheria or tetanus. Um, so you get your five doses, two months, four months, six months. Uh, you get it around 15 to 18 months and then off to school age. And it's really well tolerated. Ouch, it hurts, but it's not the fever and the rash that you get with the live vaccines like the MMR. Tetanus boosters, this comes up. So it's a public health measure to be giving it every 10 years for someone who's just coming in. Just so you know, tetanus lasts for a long time, the immunization lasts for a long time, and other developed countries like the UK don't do booster shots every 10 years after adulthood. They do have a stiff upper lip, but they don't get lockjaw, so, um, so they don't do that, but we do it every 10 years. Now, if it's a high-risk exposure and it's been less than five years, we boost, but here's the part to pull out. If you can't confirm that they've had their primary series, or it's an incomplete primary series, giving tetanus shot, a vaccine, is not the correct answer. Yes, you give that, but you need to give them tetanus immunoglobulin. Okay, so that's you know, sort of an exam type question. If the person has that, do you give them the tetanus shot? Yeah, but you need to give them the immunoglobulin if they don't have their complete series. And then with people with HIV or immunocompromised. H-flu, 
I've never seen a case of H flu. Anybody seen a case of H flu in a child? Yeah, it's the gray hairs, right? So um, I, I sort of came just after the, uh, the Haemophilus influenza B vaccine started, but my older colleagues, my respected older colleagues, would tell me that, you know, this was scary. This was, oops, I crapped my pants, kind of. The child would be quiet and drooling. And that's really scary. And these were very scary uh, uh, situations for airway conditions. And so I just, it just, whew, it's like, it's almost like vaccines work. Um, so uh, there's the immunization schedule again. I'm not going to go into the details of each particular immunization schedule. It's trying to avoid epiglottitis. I have seen epiglottitis, but the epiglottitis I've seen has all been in adults, not in children. Um, and the, uh, it's well tolerated. It's a shot, but it doesn't have usually very serious side effects. Polio, I've never seen a case of polio. Um, but I have seen post-polio syndrome. I've had patients with post-polio syndrome. Um, it's a fecal-oral or oral-oral transfer, and that fecal, or sorry, that post-polio syndrome is what I'm more familiar with. Um, we immunize against it. Uh, we use the injectable form, not the oral form. Um, the oral form can have a rare side effect, and whenever I'm saying millions in any ways, I feel an urge to do this like Dr. Evil, but um, it's, it's like in the order of millions, one in a million, one in two million, something like that for uh, the oral polio. Pneumococcal, this is again kids. We're going to get into the whole um, Prevnar and pneumococcal vaccines uh, when we're talking about adults, but this is the, for the children, um, for the pneumococcal vaccine, the Prevnar, again, a four-dose series. This one can give you some local reaction that's a bit more severe, and they can have a fever in um, one in 100 to one in 50 sort of patients. So this one has a little less tolerability with regards to it, so you can expect some more side effects with it. Measles, mumps, and rubella, this is one that got the bad rap. Uh, that was po I've never forgiven the Lancet. I've got to let it scab, but it's the Lancet where that famous article, and I'm not going to give that physician's name because they were struck off the registry. They're no longer considered a physician in the UK that started this um, sort of big surge in not taking the MMR because of a supposed link to autism. But uh, the MMR is the one that can give you, you know, a fever and a rash in about a one to two week time period. Uh, have I seen measles? I've seen coplic spots back in 1995 during my residency. And that's when our country came out with giving a second booster shot for measles to give everybody another boost because you usually uh, got it at one year and then we started giving it at school age at five years. So I did see a patient with coplic spots, but I haven't seen measles since then, but I don't go to Disneyland very often. Right? It's like, ah, oh, people. Um, anyways, uh, and then mumps. I've not seen a case of mumps, but of course, you can get the salivary glands, obviously the orchiditis, and then rubella. Again, another sort of looking back over 50 years of my life, um, I li grew up in London, Ontario, and in London, Ontario, um, we had a school for the deaf. It was called the Robart School for the Deaf, and the vast majority of the children were there because they had German measles. Their mother had German measles during their pregnancy, and they were born deaf, and so they had to consolidate and have a school for the deaf. Guess what that school is now? Closed. It's, again, almost like vaccines work. All right, so um, there are the shots. It's two shots. You get it at your birthday and when you're going to school. Adverse reactions, again, one to two weeks. And I, and I always remember this when I see, you know, especially during the winter months and I'm seeing these kids come in and the volume is there and everybody's got the sniffles, everybody's got maybe a low-grade fever, runny nose and stuff. And, are, and then when they come in with a bit of a rash, I always have to go, oh, yeah, didn't we just immunize Johnny? right, a week ago? Because you can forget. I mean, sometimes you can forget, you know, the patients you saw a day or two, but talk about a week or two before uh, remembering their immunization. So I always kind of remember that if I see that sort of four or five-year-old kid with a fever and a rash, it's like, oh yeah, when did we do the MMR? Rotavirus. Um, rotavirus is the leading cause of severe gastroenteritis worldwide. So we've got an oral vaccine for that, two months, four months, six months. It's well tolerated. Hep A and B for children again. So again, you start at, uh, at their birthday and you give the second dose uh, six to 18 months later for Hep A. Hep B, you do the three shots, times zero, one month and six months. All right. Chicken pox, 
Again, if you're old enough, you'll remember that people used to have chicken pox parties. Doesn't that seem weird? Hey, my kid's got a communicable disease. Come on over. We'll talk Tupperware, right? Like, I mean, they, people had this so they could get it out of the way. So there was a practical reason. They just wanted all the kids to have it, you know, in the neighborhood and stuff like that. But it's not a benign condition. It's not a passage of right. It can be serious and deadly. And so now well, we vaccinated uh, against it. And the chicken pox I seen, the vast majority of chicken pox I see is shingles, right? That's the chicken pox I see. I don't see it in children, rarely. So there's the recommendation, they get it on their birthday and when they're off to school. So birthday and off to school, again, this is one of those immunizations that can give you a pain in the arm, a uh, low-grade fever, and a potential rash. All right, so that's the childhood immunization. We're gonna go to the adult immunization. It does get a little complicated when we get into the uh, pneumovax and the Prevnar stuff, and it gets a little complicated when we get into the shingles now that we've got uh, a second vaccine that's come out and replaced the earlier one. So let's talk about Tdap. Um, that's the adolescent and adult formula. It's tetanus, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis. And we're giving now that booster shot, that one booster shot, uh, into adolescence and adulthood to include pertussis because of, first of all, it's not a great vaccine. So we've got a great as in like, uh, you know, hepatitis B, it, it really works well. You get an antigenic response, right? Not so much for um, pertussis. And the whooping cough, and the whoop is usually seen in children, right? Cough, 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 cough. <gasps> you don't get the whoop usually in adults. It's rare in adults to get that whoop. But what it is, is a 100-day cough, and it can last 100 days. If the child isn't old enough to be immunized, so under the age of two months, this is life-threatening. And so we're giving it to every pregnant woman, right, for each pregnancy so they can get some passive immunity going to the child or the neonate or the infant during that vulnerable stage. And if you see a child that's cough, 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 coughing, or if you get an exam question that says, you have a child with, you know, like a one-month history of cough coming in with rectal prolapse, and they say, what do you think the diagnosis is? Pertussis. They cough so hard, not only do they whoop, but they blow out the rectum. Okay, so rectal prolapse can be associated with that. So again, we're giving it now for one dose. Uh, healthcare personnel, of course, we're giving it to them, and then there's the pregnant stuff. I was one slide ahead. There's the pregnant stuff for uh, making sure that we're giving it to each pregnancy. And so, you know, I know that we're always talking about, oh, tetanus every 10 years or five years for certain situations, but if a woman is pregnant every year, she gets that immunization to pass along that pertussis immunity to her unborn and recently born child. Herpes zoster, so uh, ASAP recommends uh, the following. Uh, it used to be uh, um, Zovirax, and so some of you may have received Zovirax, but now we've got Shinrix, and Shinrix is more effective, but it's two doses, and so you need two doses, the first dose, and then the second one at least two months later for that immunization. And the question comes, um, if, I've ha if the patient has had the uh, Zostavax, are they supposed to get the Shinrix, and what's the answer? Yes, they are. Ooh, you're coming alive. Okay, um, and it's not live attenuated, so um, it's not contraindicated. So therefore, you can give it to pregnant or immunocompromised people. And that's one of the reasons why it's got an advantage over the previous ones. And yes, you should give it to those patients who've already received Zostavax. So I've got to go in and get my Shinrix because I'm on the wrong side of 50 now. All right, pneumococcal vaccines. Pneumo, pneumovax and Prevnar, and I'll stumble through this because, you know, one's got the 23 strains, one's got the 13 strains, and there's, I always have to look this up. I, I, I can't, every, it's, it's sort of like renal function. I, I, you know, it's hard to memorize. I've done it so many times, and still I have to look it up every once in a while to figure it out. So this is for people over the age of 65. They should receive both. If they've had neither, you start with Prevnar first, and then 12 months later, you give the pneumovax. If they've already had the pneumovax, then you give the Prevnar 12 months later. That seems pretty simple, I got that. But once the uh, pneumovax is given after the age of 65, no booster is needed. So if they've had one shot after the age of 65 with pneumovax, they don't need another booster. But look at how complicated this gets. Okay, if they're under 65 and, they, and you're talking about pneumovax and they have a history of asthma or a smoker, diabetes, heart, lung disease, kidney disease, 
all right, work in a long-term care facility, or, or in a long-term care facility, sorry, one booster after the age of 65, but greater than five years after the first shot. This is turning into my taxes, people. I need someone to help me with this. I need an app for that, all right? Chronic renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, asplenic or immunocompromised, give one booster greater than five years later, regardless of age, and give another booster greater than age 65, greater than five years after the first shot. Can you see how complicated that gets? So I look it up, I just do. And, and if it came up in the exam, you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, that's my mulligan. I'm like, I, you know how much time it would take me to know that for that one moment in time? Because I'll forget it. Okay, so I consider this my mulligan. Um, and so here's, here's an example. Which of these patients should receive Prevnar? A smoker, age 50, patient with diabetes, you know I'm gonna be counting on you over here, yeah, front row, you know, like, or do, or do you already got one question right, so you're done for the day? All right, um, cochlear implants, age 40, and asthmatic on inhaled corticosteroids. What's the answer? D? Oh, you got to shout it out. Oh, is this C? C. Yeah, cochlear. That's why I was doing this. Cochlear implant. Yeah, because it's Prevnar, not Pneumovax. And it was Pneumovax that I just went over in the last three slides saying I'm confused, and then I threw Prevnar at you on purpose. Okay, so it's cochlear implant. So immunocompromised patients under the age of 65 should receive both, right? And then they've specifically listed chronic renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, CSF leaks, the cochlear implants are there. And if they've never had either, give Prevnar first, and then two months later, give Pneumovax. And if they've had the Pneumovax, then you give the Prevnar one year later. It's like, ugh, why couldn't it just be eight weeks again like the other one? It's not, that's the recommendation. Flu vaccines, get your flu shot, people. All right, um, uh, it's recommended for everybody over the age of six uh, months of age. Pregnant women are at increased risk, actually. There's the trivalent, and then there's the supercharged for our seniors, our per people of certain maturity that get the high dose vaccine or the flu zone. Um, there is this nasal mist. I'm not using the nasal mist, and there's been some warnings recently about that. I never really was a big fan. Um, for my younger patients, that the parents, um, and, and I'm not trying to gender stereotype, because we know that 80% of child health care is provided by the mother, the woman, um, I would have them come and do a drive-by shooting. And so they're already in a five-point restraint car seat, and I consider that, oh yeah, I'm checking that, make sure it's installed correctly, five-point restraint, <laughs> they can't move. They're restrained. And so I've given flu shots that way for the very challenging cases. Um, but flu mist is a live attenuated one, so there's all these things about not being able to give it to certain people with immunocompromised or pregnant women. Um, for patients who report an egg allergy, they can still get the flu shot um, unless it's anti anaphylaxis. And there are flu preparations now without um, egg products or weren't developed within eggs, so they can get that. They're more expensive, but they can get it. Um, I have a YouTube video. I, I dress up as Bat Doc as my avatar, and I wear a Batman mask, and I give out medical advice. There's things you can do with a mask on that you can't do with patients without a mask on. So I give out medical advice, and I auto-tune my voice down like Christian Bale and I talk like this. So I have a flu shot video out uh, dispelling the myths about the flu shot, and it's when the hospital came to me and said our staff immunization rate wasn't high enough, and they challenged me as the chief medical officer to see if I could encourage the staff to consider you know, getting immunized, because our immunization rate wasn't that great for our staff, and I thought, well, I have to do it in a non-threatening way. They gave me a nice round budget to work with, Thank you, administration. And uh, so I just took my cell phone, put on a Batman mask, and then I'd talk like this. And you know, and somebody would say, doesn't the flu shot hurt? And I would say, suck it up, buttercup. Bet you bruise like a peach. And our immunization rate went from 60% to 95% with the nurses sharing it on Facebook. So you can make an impact. Anyways, uh, you can get it uh, if you are allergic to eggs. All right, question, an 18-year-old needed an updated immunization. She got her first hep B shot and a second one three months later. And remember, it's usually time zero and one month. And the third one is supposed to be given six months later. It's been three years now since she had that second shot. Do you start the series again or do you just give her the shot? Just give her the shot, yeah. They're minimums, not maximums. Okay, so this is hepatitis B for adults. 
you know how it's transmitted, and most deaths are due to chronic liver problems. So hepatitis in A and B for people over the age of 18 with other risk factors, uh, diabetics under the age of 60 years old or non-immune, vaccinate hepatitis B as soon as possible. And again, they're minimal intervals, not maximum intervals. So you want six months between the first and second shot um, if it's for hep A, for hep B, it's that time zero, one month, and six months. Uh, the vaccines never repeat the earlier shots unless they didn't sort of convert. Um, we've had people like that. And the guidelines of the timing represent a minimum. Meningococcal, this is my other mulligan, I think. Um, uh, Neisseria meningitis, there are the serotypes. They certainly follow cyclical patterns. You'll get outbreaks of meningitis, usually in adolescence, and I've got two kids in university now, and so it's like, they're immunized, all right? Because um, I'm concerned about those things. There's the two quadrivalent vaccines, but they don't contain um, the B type. So the conjugated vaccines for age under 55 and revaccinate every five years for persons with persistent increased risk for meningitis. How about in kids? Well, adolescents, again, 11 to 12 year olds give a booster at age 16. So they get one, you know, preteen, and then they get one when they're 16 to 18. But if they got their first shot, at age 13 to 15, you give a booster at 16 to 18, but if they got their first shot after the age of 16, you don't give them another one. Again, this is my second mulligan, thank you. All right, uh, vaccinate any person between the ages of two and 55 with increased risk, okay? So they don't have a functioning spleen, they're immunosuppressed. First year college students, right? I've got two, a second year and a four, uh, fourth year student in college. Military recruits, crowding those people into small environments can lead to meningitis outbreaks. And traveling to countries where you go onto the CDC site and it says, hey, they should be immunized against meningococcal disease, okay. So the B serotype, these are the four strains. Um, if you start uh, one type of immunization for the type Bs, you should finish that series, not switch teams. Um, and uh, ASEP recommends B serotypes with, okay, you've got complement deficiency, you've got no spleen that's really working, you're immunosuppressed in some way. And you may give it to age 16 and 23-year-olds uh, for extra protection when they're in their college years. And preferred age, though, is to give it between the ages of 16 and 18. HPV, I know this has some other things besides medicine associated with it, but there's about 100 different strains of HPV viruses. Um, most women will have been exposed, and most women will have cleared HPV. Where do you think most women got the HPV? Men, right? And so we need to make sure that we're immunizing both men and women, or boys and girls, for HPV because we can prevent cervical cancer. I would like to live in a world where cervical cancer was eliminated. So um, Gardasil um, protects against those different strains. Um, you're supposed to vaccinate females and males, right, uh, in their pre-teenage years. And uh, CDC recommends two doses now if vaccination was started before the age of 15. Everybody has different vaccination schedules um, and, and the schedules have changed over the course of my children's lives. But when our government came out and said that they would pay for this vaccination and make it part of the regular schedule, they only made it part of women for, for girls, for females. And I'm like, so of course, you know, being, being me, called up and, and advocated that it should also be included for boys because if you want herd immunity, immunity, why are you eliminating 50% of the herd not getting immunized? So we paid for my son to get immunized, but now it is covered. All right, now we're going to finish off with some dietary guidelines, and we're going to go through these quickly. And like I said, there are like, you walk into any bookstore and there's like a long list of books dedicated to nutrition and diet and things like that, exercise. Every five years, the USDA comes out with um, got new guidelines with regards to it, and we're going to summarize some of it. So look at how small that type is. It's ridiculously small. So clearly, we're not going to cover it all. Just say, eat a healthy pattern of food, focus on a variety of foods, limit your salt and sugar intake, are the motherhood statements, um, shift to healthier food beverages, limit your alcohol intake, and support healthy eating patterns for all. Those are the big five things from the dietary guidelines that go from 2015 to 2020. Now, what do they mean by a healthy eating pattern? Well, you know, fruits and vegetables, we need to increase those and decrease all the saturated fats, all right? So these are big picture items. 
Um, and then when it comes to physical activity, you maybe ask questions about what is the physical activity for children. We need recess, we need play, we need 60 minutes. Children need 60 minutes of play every day, right? Or physical activity, aerobic activity, some muscles, muscle strength activity, and some balance. But really, it's getting them up and moving and off their screens and getting out there and doing stuff for 60 minutes a day. Um, when it comes to adults, we don't need 60 minutes a day. They talk about five times a week, 30 minutes. If you're doing moderate intensity exercise, you can do that high intensity, that hit stuff, where you only have to do 15 minutes five times for a total of 75 minutes a week. But for most adults, it's supposed to be 150 minutes a week, how you spread that out. But five times a week for 30 minutes gets you to that number. And if you want to do the high intensity stuff, you can you know, crush that down to 75 minutes by doing high intensity for 15 minutes. And then for our older uh, patients over the age of 65, um, the recommendation is actually the same. It's do what they can do and try to add a little bit more on balance because falls is such a risk and be can be so devastating for our older patients if they fall. And then the physical activity, these are the definitions with regards to moderate, Intensity, vigorous intensity, and you can go through this on your own. What is considered muscle strengthening and bone strengthening activities? All right, coffee is necessary for my life. Yes, um, you would not like me without coffee. So, uh, but it always comes up how much is safe and all that kind of stuff. Normal two to three cups a day is fine. Uh, in fact, there's some research that shows that it's associated with a decreased risk of diabetes and gallstones. How about in pregnancy? One to two cups a day, but we're not. 100% sure, but certainly under two cups a day is where I'd go. When my wife uh, was pregnant, um, again, it's, it's, you know, an essential uh, food. Um, it was like, just do 50-50. This is what we did, because she liked two cups of coffee a day. We just did 50-50 uh, caffeinated and decaffeinated, 50-50 uh, for two cups. So it was like she was drinking one cup a day. All right, now we're going to go through some vitamins. Which of these vitamins taken in high dose for prolonged periods of time because anything, right, like a, the difference between a drug and a poison is dose and duration. So which one of these can cause neuropathy? Shout it out. C, vitamin C? Do I have consensus? Should we poll the audience or should we vote them off the island? So the answer is B, vitamin B6, okay, for taking too much for too long. And let's go through that. So we have our water-soluble vitamins. B1 is thiamine, right? You get berry berry and uh, adult berry and uh, halle berry, no, berry. Um, uh, Wernicke's corkoscop, <laughs> obviously where my mind went for that one. Um, but anyways, uh, B1, so if you're deficient in that, I'm gonna go through the highlights of what, what can either, if you're taking not enough or too much toxicity, where you get it in your diet and all that kind of stuff. So B2, uh, sorry, B2 is riboflavin, and uh, you, know, you get problems with deficiency with edema and mucous membrane problems, uh, glottitis. B3, though, the niacin, I think that's a good one to remember because we know that a lot of our patients won't tolerate taking supplementation of that because of the flushing, and so that's what I usually take home from that. And if you take too much of it, it can be liver toxic even though that's water soluble, not necessarily peeing it out and making expensive urine. So B3 niacin. B6, this is the one that is the toxicity for the peripheral neuropathy if you're taking it too much for too long. And B12, we should be familiar with B12. Of course, if you're deficient in that, you can be anemic, just like folate you can be deficient in. Vitamin C, so vitamin C, that's what gives you scurvy. Who's here has seen a case of scurvy? In the US? Wow, isn't that just terrible, right? You know, like vitamin C, you know, pennies. Anyways, um, you know, from a toxicity standpoint, it really doesn't cause a lot of toxicity. There's that false negative stool thing. But you know, the, the real big side effect if you're taking too much vitamin C is weight loss because that wallet you have, you are peeing out expensive urine, right? So you just pee it out. So they're really, uh, you know, the toxic dose. People have taken mega doses. And you know, it, uh, it always reminds me of the story of Linus Pauling, right? Very smart, obvious individual. Very smart, won two Nobel Prizes, and then went way into the mega dose vitamin C. So just because you're an expert in one area does not mean you're an expert in another area. 
Um, folic acid, yes, and anemia, right? Important for uh, RBC production. Fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A and vitamin D. Vitamin A, um, if you don't have enough, it's poor vision. Vitamin D, you know that that's for bone strength and you'll get rickets if you're um, deficient. Vitamin E, again, fat-soluble. And uh, you can certainly get uh, neurologic problems, vision problems if you don't have enough. And as vitamin K, you should be vitamin K experts because of our uh, association with warfarin, right? And my concern is now that we have these DOACs out, we're going to have a whole generation that didn't know about warfarin or how to manage INRs. Um, it's something, something that I talk to residents about quite a bit. And that's it for community medicine part 2 I'll be back later. Thanks.